So, so, all right. So, so I've done a bunch of academic work in. I mean, I'm an academic now and have been for uh, a lot of the uh, recent past, and I tend to focus on the types of things that I'm involved in, like the Debian project and like free and open source software. And as it turns out, a lot of other people, uh, both within the Debian community and in many cases outside of the Debian community, have looked at the Debian project as a source of inspiration and as a source of knowledge about the way that large communities, large voluntary organizations, um, <coughs> hackers, et cetera, et cetera, um, work. So, so, and they've come to a lot of conclusions that in many cases they believe apply to a variety of other types of organizations that apply to other large voluntary projects, other free software projects, et cetera. And one thing that has frustrated me a little bit about this is that while they while there has been a huge amount of research that has used Debian as the sort of the object, um, the, the the ethnographic sample in terms of, uh, of ethnographies and, and the sample in a whole set of other things, other fields, for the, in the vast majority of cases, this information never makes it back to Debian. So, so my thought with this talk is, why don't we try to? Why don't I try to to close the loop? Why don't I go out and look at a bunch of groups and individuals, many of them academics, but not all of them, who are looking at the Debian project for inspiration and and making conclusions that they believe apply more broadly, and then tell Debian about them, right? Because if because if they apply to other projects, because if they because if the research from Debian applies to other projects, it almost certainly applies to Debian, right? So what is it that we can learn from looking at people studying us? That's sort of the idea. Um, so, so the structure of this is going to be a lot less like one talk and a lot more like you know, 10 or 11 lightning talks. Um, let's see, uh, I didn't have a clock here. Um, so I'm going to watch, so I, I, should, I, should, I should time myself strictly. So uh, great, so that I can, I can uh, in fact, do this. So I'm, I'm going to try to, in most cases, talk less than four minutes on, on any particular paper or subject. And, uh, and I'll put up um, um, what I'll, in many cases, all I'll show on the slide is just a, a, a reference so that you can go and look this stuff up and, and, and do it. But I'll try to and learn more about it. But, but in many cases, the language that's used, the methodology that's used, are ones that are not familiar to the free software, to, to, to the Debian project, which is the reason why many of the people who do this work, even though many of the people I say, you know, the world outside Debian, even though in, may, in several of these cases, the people doing the research or writing things up are actually from the Debian project or around here, they're often presented in terms that are not the ones that would be you know, as easily understandable. So I'll try to do the, the bird's eye view. So I mean, without further ado, since I'm on a strict schedule, I will, uh, I will rush forward. So um, the, first, the first group I'm going to talk about is uh, software engineers, and in particular, people who like to study software engineering. Um, in particular, uh, a lot of these people are academics. Um, many of them work in business schools or in this sort of, in this area called organizational studies. They look and see how organizations work. And in many cases, they look and, they look and see how software is produced and how people might produce software better. And um, free software in particular, and it, 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 they come up with a lot of descriptions for the way that things work. And as it turns out, you look at the free software community and they're completely unable to explain why it works. Um, they say, well, you need you know, a manager, you need that, and a whole set of things. And they look at, wow, wow, that's totally not going on here. So this has been a really interesting point of research for a lot of people um, because, because it's, it's questions that are difficult to understand. And, and, and many people have decided to study Debian. So um, one group I'll talk about is this group in Madrid um, who was uh, presented a little bit earlier on Sunday. Um, by, by Javier presented a, a, a bit of their work. But one of the things that, that, that um, this group, sort of he headed by uh, Jesus Gonzalez Barona, uh, Barahona, uh, was, has, has spent a lot of time on, on counting and how to look at how much stuff is in there. So, so, so this is a, um, I'm, I'm not gonna spend as much time on this as I could because, because this has already been discussed a little bit in depth. But um, um, the, the major question behind a lot of this stuff is statistics scattering. And, 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 and more and, and, and how big and how economically important as a result is free software. So this is actually a really interesting question. A lot of people want to know how um, um, they want to know how hard it would be to produce something like etch, right? And so they do things like count lines of code, count the number of um, uh, times that they go, the um, amount of effort that goes into it. And as it turns out, Debian, because it's this 
collection of everything, and this is a sort of theme that I'll come back to, turns, to be, turns out to be a really excellent place to start because it's sort of this snapshot of, of the free software universe. Um, um, so, so there was this, originally this paper um, um, written by someone named David Wheeler who uh, looked at Red Hat and concluded that it was worth a gigabuck, um, um, or, or uh, I guess 10 to the, uh, uh, 10 to the yeah, a billion uh, dollars. So, 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 and and um, and then and then this group said, well, well, actually, looking at Red Hat, it's even looking. It's, it's much smaller than that because you can look at the Debian project, which is much bigger. And they've gone through a whole a whole set of um, things to determine not just first how big it is, but then also how many people are contributing to this, how many and how many things are sort of connected to each other. Um, and and as a result, I mean, th this research is, research is primarily descriptive, so so we all have a sense, but. But uh, it's interesting stuff because because you can get you can get an idea for just how many you know millions and millions and millions of hours have gone into producing the stuff that we have right there, and actually it's 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 really quite staggering. Um, um, I guess the benefit that we can take is that even though we sometimes look a little uh, can be a little frustrated by the sort of swelling size of the archive, at least uh, useful to some people. Um, uh, there's another group, um, um, another paper that I looked at, which was this idea of um, trying to do sampling, um, which was done in, in, uh, by a group in, by a group in, in Zurich. And here's a, uh, a, a link to the paper. But, but the idea is that they did sort of a similar argument, and they were trying to look at a, a, the, the free software community in general. But their question was a little bit different. They wanted to do sampling. They wanted to look at um, uh, a, you know, creating useful samples of the free software community. And it turns out people do this a lot. And what they've historically done is look at SourceForge. Um, SourceForge has like, I don't know, tens of thousands of projects, something like 70,000 projects. But um, there are lots of problems with it. Um, one, of, one of the problems is that, uh, is that most of the projects in SourceForge have failed. Um, in the, in the, the number of projects that have never had an upload, very high, never done a release. Um, the number of projects that, and, and um, I mean, there's other ones, it's also, it's also incredibly incomplete. The vast majority of the largest and most important projects, you know, GCC, Emacs, I mean, you name a project, and it's probably not posted at SourceForge. Um, so, so, so as a result, we have this. It's useful in that there's this huge collection of pieces of software, but it's but it's not useful in that for the most most of the time they're not very useful, um, or they're not the ones that are most used, or they're not the ones that are most downloaded. So, if you're interested in and so 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 in this way, it creates a very incomplete sample. Um, you know, in steps, in steps, Debian, right? And they argue that Debian is better suited to sampling because it avoids these it, it avoids biases um, and it also has unique information that's um, only only available in this integrated environment right so sourceforge sure it describes a few things about the software but debian has has um, a whole ton of extra information dependency information maintainers people you can ask about what's going on in there something that in many cases sourceforge doesn't provide um, this group is um, particularly, uh, I think this group is particularly interested in, in this idea of reuse. So they want to know um, how often are pieces of code reuse and how, and does this happen more often in the free software world? It seems like it should. Um, and this is a question that's reasonably difficult to answer in SourceForge, but it's really easy to answer in Debian because, you, because we've got dependency information to describe every library that's used from, from, from anywhere else. Um, so I mean, sure, it doesn't, it doesn't stop the people that have cut and paste you know, new diff into their application. You know, the hundred times that's happened, mm -hmm. but, but 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 it's a pretty good start. Um, so 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 it turns out that many people studying free software first need to assemble a sort of comprehensive list. Debian provides that list, right? Um, um, they they've got information about different versions over time. We've got we've got guidelines and standards for 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 including that information. Something that SourceForge, for the most part, doesn't because any 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 idiot who wants to create a SourceForge project can. Um, um, but but getting a project from Debian is I don't know maybe slightly harder because at least one person needs to use it, um, um, and there, and there uh, uh, or, or or needs to maintain it not use it. Um, although that might be a, a nice rule. Um, the, 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 there, there there are also information on sections and tags right dev tags awesome huge amount of information added by humans about packages that are in there um, great information that's really hard to get out of free form descriptions in source page. There's also these contact people that I mentioned. Um, um, and there's also the fact that Debian is just way more complete. Um, they said that they sampled 157 random libraries in the Debian project, and then went to check to see um, how that stacked up to FreshMeet. Only 39% of those projects posted in, in uh, uh, 39 of the sample projects were available had FreshMeet pages. Um, no, only 58% only had FreshMeet pages, and only 39% were on SourceForge or Tigris 
or really OS or any of these um, uh, any of these other sort of hosting things. Um, so in this sense, Debian is a snapshot of all that's sort of out there. And this other little bit that's nice is that Debian, for the most part, only contains successful projects. At least, if successful means they've done at least one release, something that uh, something that something that SourceForge uh, doesn't have. So that's sort of a cool little thing. All right, it's time for that. Um, uh, here's 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 one that is someone who's not not so outside the Debian project. Uh, uh, um, Martin Nickelmeyer, of course, our our former fearless leader. Um, I spent the a huge amount of time in the next few years. I mean, here's a list of some other papers he wrote on Debian. Um, uh, but 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 um, um, uh, a few. He's he's. But but what's interesting is that because most of his work is focused on you know writing to this sort of audience of software engineering, not all of it is always accessible or visible within the project, but he's made some really interesting conclusions by looking at it. Um, this is a dissertation which I read um, in the last week and I actually enjoyed. Um, I, I hope my, my, own, my own thesis can be as entertaining. Um, he, he talked a lot about, I mean, one of the questions that he asked was that, was that can volunteer teams, you know, with their uh, high volatility regarding project collaborations, ensure consistent levels of quality in their output? And, and if they do, how do we do it? What are some techniques that we can do? And he looked particularly on the, on the role that release management and different styles of release management plays, something that maybe uh, we uh, have learned a little bit about and could stand to learn a little bit about as well. Um, um, so, so, so it begins with this sort of discussion of quality management and ends with a longer discussion of, of release management. And, um, and, it, and it does seven in-depth case studies. Among those, Debian is the one that he's most familiar with probably, but it looks at the GNOME project and the Linux kernel and a variety of other places. He he does mostly qualitative sort of a qualitative sort of analysis, meaning that meaning that he does a lot of interviews, he follows the project over two years, he looks at mailing lists, documents, spends a lot of time at uh, direct observation, so on and so forth. Um, his conclusions are really are really interesting. What he ends up doing is he ends up coming out and arguing very strongly for time based release schedules in the context of voluntary projects in particular. Um, um, this is something that, that, I mean, we've sort of seen GNOME you know, doing time-based releases that sort of worked, but GNOME, of course, is a very different type of project in that they have a lot of sort of people paid to work on it, um, um, and Debian's a little bit different, but he, but, but, but he says looking at a variety of projects that time-based releases are absolutely essential um, um, because there's a lack of planning, which leads to problems, which such as delays and, and quality, um, and it's especially important for volunteers because, because of two factors that he says that time-based releases in, uh, introduce. Regularity, the first one, Meaning that, meaning that you have a, um, this, a specific interval allows projects to create sort of a, uh, a reference point that shows contributors what kind of changes other members of the projects have made. Um, and that contributes to familiarity with the release process and, and to discipline, um, but friendly discipline, I'm sure. Uh, and the second thing is schedules. Um, and so, so having time-based releases without firm schedules, he says is, completely, is, is shown to be totally ineffective. So firm schedules and ones that are stuck to um, in that in the you're using time rather than features as the orientation for the release and, and as a result, planning becomes possible in these voluntary projects. Um, and, he just, and he describes sort of important de de deadlines and um, uh, with methods for tracking dependency information and so on and so forth. So anyone who's at all interested in uh, Debian releasing um, or in the release team, um, I absolutely uh, suggest uh, reading, his, reading, his, reading his dissertation because it has some really great stuff and some interesting conclusion. All right. Okay. So here's the next one. Um, there's his. There, there's some of the other papers that he's written. These are just the ones on Debian. Um, he's published lots of other ones in the last few years as well. So uh, he's been busy. Uh, and unfortunately, he wasn't able to here to talk. Um, here's one that uh, we did a few years ago. Um, that Martin did it, um, and I, I had the privilege of helping out a little bit on. Um, but I, I sort of realized that we hadn't ever really communicated this to to the Debian project. So I'll, I'll do that now. Um, the the the. Very quickly, the basic idea was that there, we were sort of asking about what are the problems and solutions that are associated with voluntary labor and with the role of the individual of individuals in free software projects. And, and of course, um, most of us should be familiar um, in the Debian project with some of the problems there. I mean, people get busy, people go away, people block things, you know, people do NMUs, which have developed over a period of time this sort of stigma, and as a result, uh, people get very upset. Um, um, and we've looked at the role of and look to the role of, of, of group maintainership, which also has a series of problems. If you have team maintainership, one thing that we found um, by looking at, you know, um, doing a, a bit of analysis was that people are much more willing to, if you've got a group repository, people are much more willing to do commits than they would be otherwise. They're willing to make changes, but, they're, but, there's, but, 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 the, but the group in general is much less likely to do a release 
of the total, the, the, the name of the individuals. Um, meaning that if, you, if, you, if you've got you know, a given project, we can call I mean, it, it can be, um, um, glibc was a great example. glibc went from being maintained by an individual to being maintained by a group. There began, there became much, much more work in glibc and, 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 and much less frequent uh, releases because while more people were empowered to make changes, no, no one felt empowered enough to speak for the entire group and make that release. Um, so that's an interesting sort of issue. One thing that, seem, one thing that Debian has done, which, which a lot of people have, have looked to as being interesting, is, using, uh, is, is having team maintainership and then explicit uploaders, group of people who are explicitly empowered. Nothing is different in that the team's still making the upload, but, but people, because their name is in a place, they feel more empowered to make the decision for the group. Um, and there's also just a matter of we learn to work in a group and be conscious of this, and if people realize this is a problem, they, they can be more willing to communicate about this and plan and do this as well. So there's a simple thing, papers, papers online, here as well. Um, and I believe, to, uh, I have two more in the software engineering thing. I've got, uh, Martin, Martin is working on, on some more stuff as well, if you want to do a, a three minute sort of thing, maybe is that? Yeah, I, mean, I can do one more if you want. Okay, I'll do one more. I'll do one more. Um, so here's 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 one more. Um, um, the the this is one that I, I I read and thought was super interesting. Martin, of course, uh, because he's he's done everything. Also did this. Um, um, but but this was a quantitative analysis of of the role of volunteers working at Debian project in particular, with the idea that there would be conclusions for a variety of places. Um, they asked a bunch of questions and he had really interesting answers to a variety of these. Um, one question they asked was, one thing they looked at was the number of maintainers. Um, um, so the idea, and, and, and what they came, and the conclusion that they came to was that, was that we, the number of maintainers over the last, you know, most of the life of the Debian project has been growing pretty consistently at about 35%, um, 35% a year. Um, they also looked at, um, um, interesting to know, uh, they also looked at team maintainership. And what they found was that, what was that in, two th from, from, uh, in the period they looked at, which was between uh, 2.0 and uh, I guess the release of Sarge, um, or maybe no, maybe maybe even Woody, they found that they, they found that there was this increase from 14 packages that were team maintained, or about one percent of the archive, to 600, which is about seven percent of the archive in about six years, um, and that's not including the the well that and this effect shows up even if you don't include the QA team, which is a little bit different because they maintain a lot of packages that have been orphaned. So, so, so we've seen this sort of, um, I mean, in part because of, of uh, people finding out that team maintainership is a good thing and working, there's been this massive growth in team maintainership. They also did a lot of tracking of, of individual maintainers. So they looked at, okay, Debian 2.0, um, um, there are, are 216 contributors, people who maintain packages in the distribution. Um, um, and then they look at 2004, and only 55% of those people remained. And if you look at the life of the Debian project, you can find very consistently at any point, there's a half-life of about, seven, of about seven and a half years, 90 months, for people to persist. Meaning that, on average, Debian developers, um, um, we take a group of Debian developers, seven, um, and the, all of the people who are maintaining packages right now, in eight years, or in 90 months, only 50% only of us are gonna still be active in, in, in maintaining packages. I mean, perhaps the people who come to DevConf are less likely because we've sort of established something, but, but, but this is really interesting. So there's this idea that people are always upset that People are are losing, but if you are, are, are going, but maybe this is something that's that's. I mean, maybe maybe this is bad. Maybe there's things you want to do to, to change this, but maybe it's maybe it's not bad. It's something that's been with us for a long time. Maybe people aren't leaving to go to other things because they hate Debian. and maybe they're just leaving because people sort of burn out. Um, they, what they also saw was that burnout was something that happened basically on or off, um, meaning that if if someone the, the, there, there was a, there was a, if someone was maintaining. A series of uh, a series of packages, you know, at one time. Seven years later, they weren't likely to be maintaining less packages. They were likely to be either maintaining more packages or basically none. They were they, they had either disengaged or 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 increased maybe or a or, or state level in, in terms of their contributions. Um, also interesting to know, um, uh, maintainers who leave. Uh, um, so these people are leaving. Sixty percent of packages are adopted. Um, pretty high actually. Most people when they leave, most packages are picked up. Um, but if a package is not adopted and falls out of a release, the chance of it being picked up again, very low. Um, um, it's sort of also, they also created a, 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 they had some interesting ideas about a maturity model for determining which packages were likely to be picked up or not. Something that we might actually be able to model pretty simply in the project, which might be really, really useful. Um, um, they also sort of uh, established that experience, um, 
and importance, there was this correlation so that packages that were more likely to be used by more people tended to be maintained by people with more experience. Probably a good thing happening naturally. I guess we can be uh, pat ourselves on the back on that. Um, um, another thing, that's, another thing they, that, they, that they noted, which I think is actually very useful, is that the Debian project is not adding maintainers as fast as it's adding packages. So the proportion, the relation, so as a result, the ratio of maintainers to packages is increasing um, with time. And this actually may, may show a potential problem. So people, people, people like to, people sometimes think, oh no, and I'll talk a little bit more about this when I look at some other research. People, people are worried that, 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 that there are too many Debian developers, they're not good enough. But in fact, that may actually be not true. Each Debian developer is now, is now responsible for, on average, more packages than they were last year, and which, which was more than the year before. In fact, we should probably be adding people more quickly. We should have a new maintainer process. The, the, the goal should not be to keep people out, um, in, insofar as that's the goal of the new maintainer process. Some people have suggested that. Um, um, I've been one of the people that have suggested that. But to actually, the, the, we, should, we should work on getting people in and, and, and encouraging them to make contributions as, it, even more easily because, because we're actually creating more work for ourselves and we're burning, and, and the result of that, maybe, we don't have numbers for this, burning people out and increasing that number. So, interesting results. And then, I'll, before we move on to the next sort of section, I'll let, I'll let uh, yeah. I don't know off the top of my head, but the paper is right there. You can look in there. Can you, can you oh, there was a question uh, Joy asked if, if how sponsors were taken into account in here, and I said I didn't know. I didn't. I don't recall reading in the paper, but it, you can look there, and, and of course we can ask Martin and uh, other people as well. Um, yeah, Andres. Just just quickly, um, we're currently discussing actually the Debian maintainer status to uh, answer that question of yours. Uh, so in the future, we might have actually Debian maintainers who can upload their own packages without having to go through the entire new process. But uh, there's news on the announcements that I think AJ said something yesterday. Uh, uh, anyway, so. Can you hold on? Let's get uh, 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 another set of questions. Yeah. Well, can you define um, burnout? Can you define what? Burnout. 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 burnout means people that were maintaining packages that stopped maintaining packages. So we don't know if it's burnout or if they just sort of it moves on to other things. I'm using burnout in a very in a very sort of technical way. It's not implied. It just means people who moved on. Right? It's not. No, I, I'm not. I'm not. Uh, there, there, there are no psychologists in this team. This is not a medical condition of burnout. There's no. There's. No, it's not. These people hate Debian. Um, um, they might just. You know. I, I used to like. You know. Linux distributions. Now I like trains. <laughs> Fine. Great. <laughs> okay. All right. So Mako asked me to uh, give a little bit of an overview of the research that I'm doing, um, in addition to the talk this morning, but some of you haven't been able to make that. I assume, uh, so what I'm doing is I'm looking at method diffusion in large open source projects, and that means if there is a new tool, a new workflow, or a new something that could potentially improve, um, under what conditions are volunteers going to adopt it? So what I'm doing is I'm looking at tools that we have previously adopted in Debian, including stuff like Dev Helper, um, which is definitely one of the uh, primary tools that I'm looking at, and also many others that have been adopted or not. And I'm going to try and figure out which ones of these characteristics have actually led or suggest that this adoption was a success. Like, was there documentation available? Was the maintainer quick at fixing bugs and so on and so forth? There's a number of these characteristics, and in my research, I'm trying to find out um, where. Um, which ones of those are the most relevant? And well, this is all about like people working from outside Debian and using Debian as part of the research. I'm inside Debian, so I'm not really in that first category, but I definitely do believe that should I manage to come up with a number of characteristics that define when a diffusion is going to be successful, then that's going to have a rather large impact on open source and possibly even on uh, other fields, including organizational and management science. So this is, uh, when I started this project, I was going to look at various different uh, projects, Debian, Clone, and Git, and so on and so forth. But uh, in the end, now I'm limiting myself down to Debian only. Not only because it's already quite a nightmare to get all this data, um, but also because Debian is a closed system and I can actually do much better research within Debian that can then be ported to the outside than if I would focus like on other projects at the same time. 
doing things like Debian and Plone is like comparing apples and oranges in some ways, so I'm just limiting myself down to Debian. Does that answer your questions? Thanks. My question. Yeah. <coughs> okay, and? All right, social scientists. Um, um, not that no one there did something about social science, a lot of this stuff is social. So the first, the first thing I'm gonna talk about um, is this interesting paper on managing the boundary of an open project, which focused, um, a vast majority of the paper focused on Debian, and in particular on the Debian new maintainer process. Um, it looked at, it, 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 this sort of touched a, a nice little bit of my heart, but heart. I, I applied to become a Debian uh, maintainer right before the process, uh, before the process changed. And then, and then I put in the wrong email address to mail me back at, and I didn't get the mail back, and then had to go through the, I was one of the first people to go through the new maintainer process because I had just put in the wrong address, so, um, um, and didn't notice until, why well, haven't I heard anything three months later? So, so, so I was sort of watching this entire process when it happened, so it was a pretty interesting sort of thing. So I looked at the creation of the new maintainer process. There was this period where you basically, I mean, it was a little bit more complex than just emailing someone saying, I, 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 social contract, thumbs up, um, um, uh, I'm good. Don't worry about it. Uh, and 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 then and then moved to this process where where people where there was this whole process by which people were you know uh, added to the thing and then added to the project. And then one of the decisions that and there were a couple of decisions that were made. Um, there was a group of people who were sort of became the new maintainer committee, which sort of now is the group of application. It's all the people who do all the AMs, all the application managers. And these are the people who, for the most part, decided decided for the project what the requirements were going to be for someone joining the project. Really interesting sort of a uh, really interesting process, and 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 they did was they looked they looked at um, using things like the the web of trust um, what what the differences um, uh, what 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 about those people and one thing they found out was that that the best predictor for whether someone a Debian developer would become one of the people who decided what the new maintainer process was more than what packages they maintained more than anything else was how many signatures they had on their key. Um, um, as it turns out, people who had more than five connections were 65% more likely um, um, to become uh, to become one of the people who decided what to do this. And the result was very soon that that you know having strong GP, having GPC signatures is something we care about. Okay, sure, but 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 th th there was um, um, te tenure in fact had a had a negative effect. New members were much more likely to want to participate than people who'd been there for a long time. Um, the result being that, that what happened was this creation, and, and this is still true roughly with the new maintainer process, people who are more recent uh, um, developers are more likely to be participating in this process than, than, than maintainers who've been here for a long time, which means that there's this process by which people who, and, 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 and there's this fact that as the system became stricter, and, and it, it sort of created this little loop, where people were asked lots of strict, strict questions, the people who went through there and who liked the idea that this was a, a, a method for decision became the people who then came back and asked increasingly strict questions. And as a result, the new maintainer process has gotten increasingly difficult. And you can look at this, and this paper looks at the way that it gets increasingly, increasingly difficult. I mean, it used to be, I mean, even since the new maintainer process, the number of questions asked, the number of hours spent, um, 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 lead to this. Now, I mean, I can do my own sort of editorializing which about this. I mean, I, 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 I told a, a story once, this is, someone once told me a story uh, on uh, about, about a, a, how, how a bunch of uh, scientists had, had taken rats and run them through a, through, through a maze trying to make them smarter and smarter, and they had these mice that were really good at running through a maze, um, but it turned out that they weren't actually getting smarter, they were just partially deaf and partially blind. Um, they were, they were, uh, uh, they couldn't get distracted. And, and so, 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 so my, my joke was maybe the new maintainer process by having people answer lots and lots of very long emails is training people for something other than what we really want. Um, and, and the flame wars of the future are, are something to, to worry about. Um, but in any case, um, um, I mean, that's, that's sort of a joke. Um, um, only sort of. Only sort of. Um, but, 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 it's interesting to, but, but it's interesting to look at the process that's brought us to where we are today and so the values that have sort of um, played into this based on the self-selection of people who are participating in this process. And I, I think that I, I found this, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, about 50 pages, but it's, you know, it's double-spaced. It's actually a really quick read. And I would recommend it to anyone who's interested in the new maintainer process or who, especially people who are in AM, to look at the way that these, that these processes have been created. Um, um, and the way that that's framing the idea of what a Debian developer is or who a Debian developer is these days. Um, and the way that it's sort of having this uh, uh, process going forward. So, um, uh, Biela, can I, can I put you on? Sure. Uh, okay. So, um, this is our resident 
resident anthropologist, uh, 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 Gail Um uh, Can you do a little bit of summary of some first stuff? Yeah, you can sit in my chair. <laughs> cool. But I promise I won't be more than five or six minutes. Um, so a lot of people know me, I'm Biela Coleman, but I thought I would give a little bit of an overview of um, what I've done and where I'm going. So, um, and how it pertains to Debian, although I have to say what uh, Mako has mostly talked about is not in my format because I'm an anthropologist and we don't really have findings. Um, but still, <laughs> I hope to make it a little bit clearer what I do. So, um, Basically, I think, um, in terms of my work, I wrote a dissertation um, in 2005 that I had worked on since 2001, and it explored the links between um, free software ethics and the liberal tradition. And by liberalism, usually when I say that word, people, especially from Europe, have a small heart attack because they think I'm talking about the liberal party, and they're like, no, I don't you know, believe or associate with that. And by liberalism, I don't mean a political party that's either in the United States or in Europe or is something that has to do only with, let's just say, the American Civil Liberties Union, but instead has to do with a certain type of philosophy which relates to questions of freedom, meritocracy, autonomy, free speech, and property. And so what I'm interested in as an anthropologist is to make sensible how it is computer hackers and free software people integrate the liberal tradition and change it through software projects, legal codes, um, and how the transformations within free software then changes liberalism in a broader capacity. Um, so basically, one of the things that a lot of social scientists have worked on in free software is the question of motivation. <coughs> Why do free software developers want to do X, Y, and Z? And for me, that's an interesting question that's been well researched, but it's not the one that interests me. Instead, what I want to get at is um, what sorts of trans transformations happen within the field of free software. So um, someone starts as a wee little developer who joins Debian and goes through the new maintainer process, learns a lot about the law, um, and also gets involved with a lot of um, conflicts and flame wars. So the paper that I have up here, which is available on Social Science um, Research Network, if you just do a, a search for Gabriella Coleman in SSRN, it'll come up, looks at three different ethical moments by which, in a sense, hackers become hackers. Um, one of which is the new maintainer process, um, which draws on an article that Mako and I wrote together. The other one is legal pedagogy, so what you learn through learning the law, and then finally, um, through crisis, and the crisis I look at was the Vancouver meeting that happened a couple of years ago. And I kind of, this is um, the strongest chapter in my dissertation, and um, the one I'm most proud of because I have a theory about the cabal, and why people joke about it, and what it, how it sort of serves to smooth over contradictions. And I know a number of people have read it, but I would really, really love it if people did read it, because right now, now I'm transitioning into um, the current Biela. I'm working on transforming my dissertation into a book, and this is obviously gonna be there, and so any sort of feedback I get would be really wonderful and excellent. Um, you know, the introduction is a little heavy, but I promise that as, as you go through it, it, it should be a little bit more understandable, and certainly much more understandable than certain other of my dissertation chapters. So, um, ooh, that was loud. So as I mentioned, I'm working on a book, which is called, is that on the next? No, oh yeah, <laughs> the rest. It's called uh, Recoding Liberal Freedom, Hacker Pleasure, and the Ethics of Free and Open Source Software. So basically, an ethnography, the purpose of it, in a sense, is like a two-way street. On the one hand, a lot of people out there don't know about the world of free software and computer hackers, and there's a lot of you know weird, esoteric things that happen in this world. So part of the point of an ethnography is to make that sense of sensible and intelligible to non-hacker people. Why do they do this? Why do they love to create technology? What are the social codes that bind them together? What's the function of a hacker conference, in a sense? How does it function to cement virtual communities? At the same time, um, while there's a lot about computer hacking that is only relevant to this world, most people would basically find very strange because they've just never experienced it. There's a lot about computer hacking that also relates to the wider culture and society in which it sits in, 
And this again is where the liberal stuff comes in, commitments to free speech and meritocracy. So, you know, we're at Edinburgh, University of Edinburgh, which of course is an education system that implements a meritocracy. So I'm interested in also um, revealing how it is that free software and computer hackers is a site whereby liberal ideas are reformulated. And in terms of sort of practical elements of this, I mean, I sort of joke that there's none, but I do think there's some. I mean, one of which is um, maybe just a little bit of perspective, that's one thing. The second thing, in a sense, that I think is really interesting with Debian is that they implement different modes of governance. And in that paper I talk about, I look at meritocracy, um, ad hocracy, and as well as a commitment to democracy. And um, in a sense, there's these different modes of governments because there's different commitments. Democracy is a certain commitment to populism and meritocracy is to who does the best work. And so by writing this, I hope it does give a sort of um, perspective on possible solutions to the conflicts between these different modes of governance. And then the, uh, the second thing is, um, which Mako has mentioned, is the question of scaling. So Debian has gone from something very small, which was almost like a village, everyone knew each other, to in a sense, something much more like a nation, where you have an identification, but not everyone knows everyone. And they've had to integrate certain solutions to make sure that you can scale effectively. So I write about that and I want to continue working on that. And then finally, in terms of more sort of broader practical implications of my work, um, if you follow the law a lot, which I happen to do, I have to read a lot of legal cases for my work, um, copyright and patent and intellectual property cases, there's an interesting move where a lot of the debates posit um, behavior based on assumptions about natural behavior, that people automatically want to do X, Y, and Z. And there's been a very nice move in the last 20 years in the law where there's been an integration of not what people, what we think people do, but what they actually do. And so, um, and people like Lawrence Lessig and Yohai Benkler who are um, lawyers and also write um, amici briefs for um, legal cases are more and more turning to live examples. So I hope that my work can contribute to that. So then uh, finally, people ask me, so Biela, what are you doing here? Are you still doing research? Are you just hanging out? You know, what's gonna happen in the future? And um, I've been very, and I'm about to wrap up, very lucky that I got um, a real job, which I'll be starting in September. And um, so, I will continue with this research project, but I also have an additional one, which is on patient activism and psychiatry. And if people are interested, they can find me because there are connections with this with this project. But I do, you know, if I do continue in this world, I'll be involved for 20 years unless I get fired, um, which is always a chance. And so I I plan to continue doing work. And one of the Next questions I would like to research is um, under what conditions people get kicked out of Debian. <laughs> I witnessed one last year, uh, very dramatically, and there's obviously been a recent one, and I think that um, sort of analyzing and writing about this process would be a, maybe a positive thing. I mean, the big problem is I don't have access to private, which is where a lot of this stuff happens. Anyway, so that's what I'm going to talk about, and you know, people can always find me if they have other questions. Any, any, anybody you thinking they might get uh, uh, thrown out of private should go and get an interview, or get, get kicked out of the project, get a doctor to talk to you all. Great. So, um, so, so, so the other jokes that a lot of this stuff isn't as isn't isn't as uh, doesn't have any practical implications. But um, I guess I I guess I, I respectfully disagree with that. I, I think that um, um, I've learned uh, although it's harder to point to like things like yes you see there's this percentage of things happen this way we need to act in this different way. Um, while that's not there, I think that a lot of the anthropological work on uh, the Debian project. Um, puts me, when I read it, it puts me in a perspective where it gives me the perspective to do a type of critical sort of analysis of the type of behaviors and sort of social systems that we're working in that ultimately leads to 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 me making arguments for particular type of changes or, or reevaluating a lot of things that I might otherwise take for granted. So, I mean, I, I appreciate that. Ooh. All right. Um, but it's not just academics. 
Um, um, and so I'll quickly, now that I've got two minutes, uh, uh, yeah, I'll go through it. Uh, uh, the, the good news is this is mostly over. There's a few, there's a few other things I want to talk about. Um, um, so as it turns out, uh, it's not just academics who are, who are interested. There, there are a lot of lawyers and a lot of people who write licenses have looked to Debian because Debian, you know, Debian Legal and the Debian Project as a whole, through things like the new maintainer process, forces people to think about licenses more than all the same as other people on Earth. <laughs> um, 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 so, 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 so as it turns out, a lot of people looked at it. So, so we all know about the, I, I won't even have to say it, um, um, I spent more of my life uh, thinking about this particular license than I imagined I ever would. Um, um, Debian, Debian Legal, in particular, criticized the GFDL and eventually got to the point where they said it was non-free for a variety of things that it had done. The biggest of these, the most important or most egregious, was the fact that it had invariant sections. And Debian took on, Debian Legal in particular, took on, you know, Richard Solomon and the Free Software Foundation in a big argument about what free was or wasn't. Um, and, and as it turns out, it seems like they we kind of won. Um, um, we won insofar as there was the FSF said, okay, we really respect your decision on this, let's talk about it and create a committee. It was uh, myself and Don Armstrong who spent a lot of time talking about uh, bits and pieces and negotiating for something. And ultimately there's a new draft of the GFDL, which you can check out now, um, sort of on, as part of this process for the, the, the new GPL. And it is so much better. And as it turns out, it does not have invariant sections and fixes a majority of the uh, the other issues that, that with the license we had a the Debian project. While while people, you know, while while you hear these 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 calls that Debian legal was sort of out of sync with the rest of the project, we had a vote on this and decided that invariant sections were not okay. The rest of it was probably all right, but that invariant sections were not something that were acceptable or free under the Debian free software guidelines. And this seems to be something that the FSF is listening to, whether or not they believe it, and are changing it in the text of their license. So um, we win. So 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 so. <laughs> As it turns out, um, um, it's not just the GFDL. Um, there's uh, this other organization that creates content licenses um, that, uh, that, 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 the, that the Debian project decided that they had some problems with. They had a, a list, a long list of eight problems. Um, um, Evan Pedromo wrote up a, a summary of a long discussion on legal with a whole list of problems. There was the problem that, that there was a request to limit the scope of requests to remove references, waive attribution after the requests. Um, allow access control of private distribution to allow distribution of uh, DRM copies if unrestricted copies were made available, uh, to require credit for comparable authorship rather than comparable authorship credit, other credit, a whole list of things, eight things. Um, and, and with the exception of one or maybe two, depending on how you count, that there was consensus among at least the group of people who were sort of chosen by Debian to represent this, we got everything we wanted. Now what's interesting is that we published this list of problems Evan, Evan published this list of problems with the, with, the, with the CC licenses, and CC came to Debian and said, we love this thing, let's work together to get these issues fixed. And it's not because CC thought that, and it's not because CC thought that it was so important to get CC works in Debian. I don't think that, for the most part, people in CC really care that much. Although they might this year. Um, um, they, they, I don't think they did then. Um, but they asked because they respected Debian's opinion as, the group of people who think about licenses more than anyone else, and who understand and who understand the real implications of very subtle, imperceptible to normal human being <laughs> uh, 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 um, differences in text on freedom in very real ways. Um, so Debian has this, and, and and they're willing to come and ask it for it. We got so we got almost everything we wanted. Um, um, as a very similar thing happened when this organization that we didn't always have such a great relationship with, um, at least after the GFDL sort of thing went through, came to us again. And Don and Brandon, who was at the time uh, DPL, and Greg Pomerantz, who's the lawyer for SPI, and myself were all explicitly selected to participate in committees. There were probably, what, 100 people maybe? Yes. 100 people in the world, right? 4% of the people who participated on committees were singled out because of their work in the Debian project. Um, 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 and for that reason, um, because they really respect our, um, our sort of ability to analyze the licenses. And as a result, I think, and as a result of the work that we've done, um, I think that the licenses are much better as a result. There's this other thing of this license, the Afero General Public License, a license that Debian Legal decided, looked at several times and decided had some serious freedom problems. It's a license that allows people to 
allows users of applications who do not have copies distributed to them to, to ask for source. It's like the GPL, except if you're using a web service, which seems to be happening more often, you can demand source code. It did this by creating a barrier to modification. It said, if software, if the software can distribute a copy of its own source code, it could, it, it, it could also, um, you couldn't remove that functionality. Turns out this is problematic because the, because Debian Legal and other people involved decided that this is problematic because one could create a piece of software that distributed its source code in a particular way. And that, like using a, I don't know, a patented service or a particular um, uh, hardware device and you wouldn't be able to remove that thing so you'd still create dependencies. As it turns out, there's a new version of the, of, of the, of the AGPL that switched what they're doing largely because of Debian, because of Debian and the involvement of people in Debian who, who, who made these sorts of arguments. Our position of the, the, the committee's position was helped hugely. The entire debate was framed because of the type of license analysis that happened in the Debian project. So lots of, lots of good stuff there. And um, one quick thing, there's this whole thing of trademark policies. We have this um, fun trademark policy. We have this open use trademark license, um, which, and then this official use license, which is not used by anywhere. I like that the HP shirt, which is apparently not the official use, used the official use logo, and the actual, and the official shirt used the open use logo, but, um, 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 maybe that's just sort of funny, but Debian has been thinking about and, and, and <clears throat> making decisions about open use trademark longer than anyone else. As a result, Debian and SBI in particular have been approached by just about every other free software organization out there who has a trademark and who wants to allow it to be free for ideas of how to make it, how to make it work. That's an ongoing discussion right now. There's not a happy ending, but um, Debian will be instrumental in doing that because Debian is instrumental in thinking about these things within the entire community. Um, and the last thing, which is something that I'll not talk about in depth too much is this whole thing of distribution makers. It turns out when people sit down to write a Linux distribution, they usually sit down in front of Debian. As a result, there's a few of these Debian derivatives. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, this is actually very incomplete. This is, about, this is about two years old, but there's quite a few of them. Um, if you come tomorrow, if you come tomorrow, there will be, uh, uh, I'm running a derivatives round table. I'll send out the email to all the participants in this. But the idea is, is that we're gonna try to get a, a group of these people who are deriving from, and we're now in this really complex situation where there are now derivatives of derivatives, and sometimes even derivatives of derivatives of derivatives of Debian. Right, they're the people who make a derivative of some Ubuntu derivative, which is a derivative of Debian, and there's some real hard, there's some hard questions we haven't answered yet about how we're all going to communicate. But this is just sort of a testament, right? When people want to create something, they look to that takes into account the free software universe. They look to the best representation representation of the free software universe in existence, which is the Debian project. Um, so, so uh, that's sort of it. Um, that's what's going on here. Um, we've got us. We've got. I mean, what we built is a. Uh, we built a, a, a summary and a collection of what's going on in the free software world. We have built something that can act as a sample of what free software is. We built one of the we built one of the best documented examples of a large, successful volunteer project in general. Um, and in terms of an explicit shared goal and work together towards that goal, I mean, this is the sort of thing that couldn't happen in this way before the internet. We're one of the examples of the largest thing uh, of the largest thing. So not only are we one of the largest free software projects, one of the largest projects of this type. Um, and as more and more work happens, you know, through the internet and stuff, examples of things that people have learned from Debian will help everyone else. And, and by keeping an eye on this stuff, um, um, there's a Debian research group of people who are doing research on Debian. And I think that I'd like to maybe organize a, a project by which we sort of do summary of our own work for the Debian projects so that we can sort of close this loop. Um, and I look forward to, you know, in, in DevConf 27, coming back with Biela as she's finishing up her lifetime of research and, and with everyone else here. And to, uh, 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 present all the great stuff that we've done here. So um, yeah, congratulations everybody. Um, we've built something that's uh, a lot more attractive than just a Linux distribution, and we've got a lot to be proud of. So I mean, if there's, if there's a question, people should leave. I mean, we're over, I don't know, but uh, we're, we're five minutes over already, so. No, we have to Oh, six minutes. All right. So six minutes. If there are people that have questions, I mean, uh, unfortunately, I can't answer a lot of the questions about the specific of this particular research. I can pull stuff up because I didn't do most of it. But uh, uh, but, <laughs> but, 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 but but I mean, I just read the papers and then talked about them. So uh, if if people have uh, questions or ideas, or if they have other research that they know of or examples they know of, that would be a great thing to share. So. It's not so much a question as an observation and a request. When you do the alphabet soup acronyms, can you spell them? Oh yeah. CC three point sounds to me like an old compiler. CC three point well, uh, it's not so old. <laughs>
Um, if it's GC3, it's a new phone app. Um, uh, Creative Commons, sorry. Going once, going twice. All right, great. See you at the room tomorrow.